Dan Johnson here at AirVenture 2011 down in my favorite area, the ultralight area. Speaking with Mark Byerly of the Earthstar company and his line of Thundergull aircraft, but this one is the Eagle. And that's not E for Eco e uh, Economic Congress or something like that. It is uh, electric. And Mark, uh, welcome to Oshkosh. You're having a good year. You just wrote an order. Congratulations. We're always pleased to hear that. But while I asked you about that, you told me something that shocked me to my core. You said you came here in a trailer. Yes, I did. Mark is a fellow that always flies to these things, however far it's been. It's been terrific and always admired that, and many people did. But we're representing an airplane, an electric airplane here, and that you couldn't do the distance. And I understand that. Most people would, I believe. But you told me something else very interesting. I want you to elaborate. You said maybe next year, right. because the technology is changing, you might not have to trailer. That's right. Please elaborate. Well, the electric uh, aircraft are uh, are in, a, in a, an explosive evolutionary stage right now. Uh, there's improvements happening in batteries and electric motors and controllers and uh, charging systems. The speed of the charging of the battery has been improving uh, by leaps and bounds. And the prices of the batteries have been coming down, and the motors and the controllers. Uh, basically, what's happened in the past is that, that the ultralight community is here right now because the two cycle engine happened to be available at a certain time, and that allowed a tremendous uh, improvement in, in uh, or, or allowed us to fly. It allowed us to fly at all, right? Fly, because fly of those lightweight. And Pretty powerful weight, uh, uh, power to weight ratio engine. Yeah, yeah. They, they were decent engines, and all of a sudden, we could fly these light planes, which light planes are very, very fun to fly. The um, and so it caused an explosion in the ultralight industry, and uh, that helped many other industries too. And over the years, uh, people have started to get a little bit more. Well, that's a two cycle engine, and I'm. You know, not really that interested because my car runs so smooth, and these are kind of vibrate more. And so uh, they've kind of reduced their energy in, in this in this area. The number of people who come in are reduced slightly over the years. So now, now we have the next generation is is a, an improvement in the power plants. It's uh, electric power. And electric power gives me the capability to make an airplane that not only is more economical, it's more ecologically friendly. Those are all really cool things, but that's not why we fly. We fly because it's Good pleasant point. and because it's fun, and and uh, we you know we really enjoy it. And something that has been a distraction for us in the past is vibration and noise. Absolutely right. And the electric motor, especially has very with those smallest two strokes, they right, seem right. to be particularly prone to that. Yeah. And on a lightweight aircraft, it was hard to isolate it with That's enough right. stuff. That's right. That's correct. An electric motor is like having a multi-cylinder engine. Uh, we've got uh, 41 magnets in here, and each one of those magnets is being pulsed with the power uh, from the coil, and so. The, the, the torque effect is very smooth. Now, what we're looking at here, to, to most eyes, used to looking at conventional power plants of any kind, is it's not really the engine at all. They're, and it's not an engine, it's a motor I recognize, so the terminology comes into play too. But this all looks to be too small. The prop is the same size, and everything else is way too tiny to do anything, and yet here you are flying. Yeah. Uh, but you said an interesting thing I want to come back to for a moment that people are hearing about battery technologies and developments relative to charging and cycles and cost and right. we're all hearing a little bit about that. I think most of us thought that well electric motors and controllers they're sort of already I hear 95 percent efficiency for electric motors compared to 50 at best for a combustion mm -hmm. and well how do you get any how, how can they improve on those things? So yeah. setting aside the battery just for a moment what Give me a, just a little bit of idea. What's changed in controllers and electric motors that has well, helped? Yeah, uh, the motor that we used to run on this on this airplane is a little cast iron uh, motor that's made in, in Germany, and, and it was uh, it's a brush type motor, and it was working, but it wasn't really designed to put out the kind of power that we need for this application. So it more of a steady state motor kind of thing yeah, than a, than lower, a real. 
Okay. So uh, we needed more power than it was designed to put out, and so it had problems. So uh, I, I sat down and I kind of detailed out a list of what is it, what would the perfect motor for my airplane be? Okay. I know and, you're good at that kind of thing, so yeah, go and, on. And so, yeah, if you take the concept of, if I could have anything in the world that wasn't even designed yet, what would it be? Sure. Well, now you have a target to go for. So I did that, and as a coincidence, about a week later I get an uh, email from a German physicist who is a motor designer, freelance motor designer. Okay. And he says, oh, I designed this motor, and he described it to me and showed me pictures of it, and he says, are you interested in it? And it was a little smaller than this, but it was very similar. And I said, well, that's really good, but it's what I really want is this, and so I emailed him my specifications. Okay. So he, he went on to his program called MotorSolve, that, that, that is a uh, 3D uh, software stuff. Okay. Yeah, 3D simulator program that you can build this motor on there and then run it. In, How? in simulation. Computer simulation, okay. And it shows what happens with the electromagnetic fields and the saturation of the coils and the, and the uh, magnets and, and all this stuff. It, it all, uh, I didn't realize they had that capability. Ah, okay. And so uh, it allowed him to do run what if studies and say what if we do this, that, and everything. And evolve the design of the process until you get a very efficient, lightweight motor. And that's what you have on this aircraft. That's what now, we have here. We, he so is this brushless then? Brushless. Okay. Yeah. He sent us the uh, the drawings and and I built the motor and uh, he came out and helped me. Uh, oh, test he did. It, test huh? it. So he's really it. interested then. Yeah. yeah. Like and, so, uh, so how many horsepower is it then? <coughs> I realize there's going to be a difference between what we're using electric and what we're using engine-wise for like a Rotax, but actually not. Not. No, horsepower is, is a is a relationship between torque, well, torque, you know, the pressure, and RPM. So this airplane used to fly in as little as 28 horsepower. What do we, what yeah. do we have here? What is this We've for? actually flown this airplane uh, successfully on, on 18 horsepower. But uh, he just has to rub that in, eh? No. You know, <laughs> reason, he can't just let it slide. The reason why I'm saying that is because I took a uh, an 18 horsepower a powered paraglider motor put it on here and set it all up and flew it. And it flew all right. Not real abundant on power, but it but it flew. And so I was doing that because I wanted to compare the direct comparison between uh, gas engines and the 18 horsepower electric power plant that right. I was putting on it. And the performance was identical. What we often see, and maybe this is what Dave is alluding to, you know, there's a number for that's uh, given to an electric motor. And then there's horsepower, which is a number that most people think they know something about. At right. least they have a relationship. So if the Rotax 277 put out 28 horsepower, what does this package here put out in comparison to that? Okay. Uh, the specification that I was working with was 28 horsepower. Okay. And so when uh, Thomas Senkel, the designer of this motor, designed the motor, he designed it to put out 28 horsepower. Yeah, but don't they use another term in oh, kilowatt kilowatts. hours? Kilowatts, yeah. Okay, kilowatts. kilowatt hours. And what what is that number? 20, 20 kilowatt hours. 20 kilowatt hours to 28 horsepower. Right. Uh, that's yeah, a relationship. There's, there's uh, 7.48 roughly, um, or seven, 748 watts per uh, per horsepower. Okay. So that's the, the comparison. That's the way okay, so it's it. a straight numerical thing yeah. then. And, as, as we all get used to this, you already said a couple other words in there that make kind of people's eyes go, uh, what? You know, I've heard something about carburetors and pistons and whether they know engines or not. Mm -hmm. They've heard these words all their sure. life. You introduce a lot of new words into the equation here with yeah. things that we're just not used to hearing and people are still getting used to that. Sure. Well, we, we will get used to it because uh, in my estimation, electric power, as the battery technology gets up to the point, like for instance right now, the battery energy densities. Yeah, is the, the battery that we often weighs hear. six times more per uh, per the output uh, compared to gasoline, and so so this bunch of stuff weighs six. Yeah, so we're six, having to carry. Or this six. bunch of stuff weighs one. Yeah. This is fuel. That's batteries. Right. Okay. And uh, um, that's that brings up another comparison, which I'm going to discuss here. I'm going to discuss something too, but. Uh, on the on the battery arrangement, we're, we're we're six times behind gasoline as far as power to weight ratio goes. 
And as the batteries improve, when they're rapidly improving, they will surpass that. And when you think they, so? They will. And it's not going to take all that long from now for them to do that. But when they do surpass that and even get into the 10, uh, 10 times improvement over what we have now, uh, which may only be a few years. Really, you think? Uh, when that happens, suddenly it will be no no reason for people to use gasoline engines anymore. No, not certainly not if the that six and that one become at least one and one. Right. Then you begin to eliminate some of it because of the smoothness right. and the lack of oil drips and those other and things the fact that people that it like. It costs me sixty cents to charge this up after an hour's flight. I was going to ask you that next. Let's talk about those numbers, but you yeah. just did it. So. What we're looking at here, is this batteries or is this controller unit? That's the controller. The controller unit. And where are we looking at the batteries? The batteries are behind the seat. There's a box back there. And then there's a few uh, batteries that are in front of the seat. We have 20 batteries. There now, last year you had some sort of vertical cells. Yeah, there's some what I would same call cells. Similar to what you showed last year. These are the same year. batteries I was running for three years now. OK. And uh, there, uh, I have 20 of those packs. So there's uh, five cells per pack, and uh, so all together we have about 4.1 kilowatts of power available, and uh, in the batteries. You convert that to time yeah. of flying? Yeah, it's about an hour. An hour, roughly okay. an hour. And what are we looking at for a total weight package then? Say again, compare this to a 277 Rotax with five gallons of fuel. What is this with the total battery pack, the controller, the motors? It's it's basically the same. Uh, the same weight, except that you're talking about five gallons of gas in a 277, and this airplane is going to run for two and a half hours, three hours. Ah, okay, okay. So and the weight is about the same as the yeah. time duration. The time duration. But now you've alluded to, you said you're using the same batteries you've been using for three years, but you right. also said that battery technology is changing. That's right. That seems that a little bit... Why wouldn't you use the new stuff then, if there's better new stuff? Be because well, of the cost. He's already paid for these batteries. Well, my yes, I understand so that too, yeah. of course. But. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I use, uh, I'm using this because I have them, and the newer batteries are better that and I can buy now. So if you went out today and you, somebody said, Here, here's all the money you need to go do this, I buy some new batteries. And, you, what, and you bought new batteries, what more would you get than what you have in I'd here right now? I'd probably get about 25-30% uh, improvement over what I have Okay, here. well that's pretty significant. So you said in just a few years you think this is going to change. What's yeah. a few? A few is like uh, three to five years. Really? Well, that's pretty near term. And, 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 I, and then that would get, in three to five years, where would, you just said 25% mm -hmm. today, what you could buy versus what you had three years ago. Maybe, maybe five or ten times what we have now. Really? Yeah. That's a pretty significant very statement. very significant. And I know, Mark, not to be one of those people who says things that are just, just smoke and mirrors. You're yeah. not that kind of guy. I've known you too long to know that. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty gigantic change, though. Big time. Yeah. And what is driving that? I mean, well, what's driving it is nanotechnology, because uh, there's there's been a tremendous development in uh, carbon nanotubes and silicon nanotubes, and these are being used in the uh, the anodes and the cathodes in the battery system. And uh, as an illustration of difference, the carbon nanotube is about that long. And it's so small that it takes an electron microscope to see it. It's a 2,000 times... Many times smaller than a human hair. Yeah, it's 2,000 times longer than it is in diameter. <laughs> and this carbon nanotube, uh, when you make them a whole bunch together, uh, has a resistance that is one million times less resistance than a copper wire. Terrific conductor of electricity. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a superconductor. I've read some of these nanotechnology things too. It's a particular interest of mine, and some of it has to do with the movement of uh, ions from the anode to the cathode and right. hastening that. That's right. So a faster discharge and by faster inverse, recharge. faster recharge. Yes, it's 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 uh, showing in the companies that are actually incorporating this technology in their test batteries. It's showing improvements right now, of like ten times. So, now let's bring this back to some practical reality. You had a trailer this year, a shocking statement for me for Mark Barley. Yeah. I'm okay with it, I'm just saying that for effect. But you said maybe next year you will fly all the way here. How would that happen? Because if you fly and then you've got to charge eight hours, well, and you only flew for two hours, well, clearly you'd have to start out about in May to get here or something. But I'm guessing that's not what you're talking about. So give us a little more. We've been talking some technology and stuff, and that's great. And there's probably always room for more. But let's bring it back to some real practical action. Right. 
How many hours would you think it would take you to get here? How long would you have to plan to get those hours in? Well, if I use the system that I have right now, just the way it is, I would be able to fly for like 50 miles or 60 miles. Okay. And then have to charge it up for two or three hours. Okay. And then fly for another 60 miles at, at 100, you know, at, uh, uh, for an hour, you know. So if and we all do right, the math on that, we can see it's going to take you a while to get here on that well, basis. Well, the, the charger that I am using is a basic bargain basement, low okay. cost, uh, low capability charger that will plug into any all out, wall outlet in any house anywhere. And it won't blow the circuit breaker because it's not using too much power. So if I use a uh, dryer plug, plug it into a big charger, it will charge my batteries. My batteries will actually be able to charge it to C. And C means the capacity of the battery. So if it says on the side it's a 4900 milliamp battery, that's 4.9 amps, hours. Okay. So if you ran it for one hour, it would be used up. Okay. That's one C. And it, it's capable of 20 C, so I could carry 20 times that much energy out of it to run the motor. Wow. Um, that means that it's a very robust battery and it doesn't tend to get hot when you use it. Ah, okay. Which the, is an important thing pilots important. are concerned about, batteries catching fire in flight and stuff. That would be very important. Yeah. yeah. And the, uh, the, the battery's charge rate is capable of 4C. Okay. So if I run it for an hour and I plug it in with a powerful enough charger and put power into it fast enough, it'll, it'll charge up in 15 minutes. Yeah. And it won't hurt it because it's designed for that. And you could also use where you were to land and you could, if somebody was following, you could have a, a pack that you just plug in and you go and you swap they can charge you as you're going, yeah. Sure, right, yeah. Like, a, like a flight school situation. Right. Seems like a ripe market for electric at some point for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. Swap packs, back in the air, get earn some more revenue sure. for your flight school. Yeah, there, there's there's companies in Israel that are, that are doing that. Commercial. Is that right? Excellent. Yeah. Now, is this unit with this engine for sale through your company now, Mark? Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the unit itself is, is the standard gas-powered version, which we then hang on the electric power. You're saying the airframe is, airframe is the same airframe same that airframe. we've seen and I've loved for many years, yeah, uh, and now so. you just got the different power plant. Right. What would that package cost? Let's say, brand new order, the airplane, the current state-of-the-art in electric, which at least gives you an hour's worth of flying with a mm -hmm. relatively, even at the slow charge, but two or three hours, that's not bad. Uh, it's not overnight, for example, so what would that package cost in rough retail terms? Oh, I, to guess at it, you're probably looking at uh, 25000 25000 okay. I have to guess. And that, of course, then is kind of like buying your fuel in advance, too. Sure. So how long would the batteries last somebody? They say, okay, fine, sign me up. How long before I got to buy new batteries and what cost would that be? That's the equivalent of buying right. some more fuel. Well, basically with the duty cycle that we normally run on the batteries, uh, we're running about 600 cycles. 600 cycles, so yeah. that's recharging. Yeah, so you're looking okay. at 600 so hours. So 600 hours, which for time. most people would be several years of flying. And it's about $2,000 for the batteries. And $2,000. Yeah. Uh, so $3 and change now. Yeah, so let's say at 100 hours a year, which most pilots don't achieve that either. Some some do. You probably do, and some others do. But most would would be doing a lot of flying if they did 100 hours a year. That's six years of flying for two thousand uh, dollars. Doing the math in my head, that's about three hundred dollars a year. Uh, that's these days. That's not even 100 gallons of gas. And in the two. 77, 28 horsepower, that burned about four, as I recall, if you're using it pretty liberal anyway. Uh, so we're talking there about only 25 hours a year. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that math may be a little off, but it's yeah, in the ballpark. ballpark and anyway, yeah. uh, so you, and in some ways, you're getting four times the utility mm -hmm. out of this existing thing. Forget that cool technology that's coming. Right. So electric power on ultralight aircraft is here now. Yes. And 25,000, that's a kit that's still going to have to build it, I understand. Sure. Uh, what's the build time? It's 150 hours. 150 hours, and as numbers go, that's a low number. So this is some great stuff. People can do it now. Yeah. Mark, you've given us a great deal of information. Thanks. There, there is one, you got thing one more that's okay. very important, and that is that uh, I was talking to the guy with the electric laser. Yeah, right. He was doing a really excellent job. With that. And he pointed out that the, the FAR 103 says that you're allowed five gallons of fuel. 
and it doesn't say what that fuel is, but the FAA recently announced a couple years ago that fuel is batteries are fuel. So we're allowed five gallons of batteries. Okay. So it's a volume So thing. physical volume, physical not volume. weight. Yeah, so he's got five gallons worth of batteries, and it's giving him, you know, uh, a lot more uh, range than what I have because I, mine is only half that big. Oh, really? You're, you're flying basically with sort of two and a half gallons. So I can carry more batteries now than, than I could before I realized that. Okay, excellent. Well, a lot of information. There's more to be obtained. You have a website. Uh, give us your website address, and, and that has your contact information so people can ask yeah. even more questions of you okay. and then send checks to you. So what's the web address, Mark? Uh, the web address is thundergull.com. It's T-H-U-N-D-E-R. G U L L uh, dot com. Excellent. And do you have a flight report on the, this line of aircraft? Now? Well, not with the electric, not yet anyway. But yes, I've flown, I think, just about all of the airplanes that you've come out with. I'm missing the Soaring Gull, but all the others, and they are, uh, I have some enthusiastic reports. You might want to read them. I've loved what Mark has done for many years. That's available on bydanjohnson.com or bydanjohnson.com. This video and other videos are available on aircraftreporters.tv.